Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Rewildology, the show that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. I might date myself with this reference, but who remembers watching Zabumafu with the Krat Brothers in the late 90s, early 2000s? For those who haven't seen the show, the main character of the show, Zabumafu, is a Safaka lemur who teaches kids about different animal species all around the world. I was obsessed with this show, and I'm positive I watched all 65 episodes multiple times while it aired on PBS. I have no doubt that Zabumafu contributed to my love and fascination of Madagascar with its gargantuan baobab trees, unique wildlife, and of course, the stars of the island, lemurs. However, a lot has changed since Zabumafu made its television debut over two decades ago. News reports and wildlife documentaries constantly portray severe habitat degradation, food insecurity, and serious biodiversity decline. When I see the headlines, I ask myself, what is actually going on on Madagascar? Are the reports truly as grim as they say? And how can we protect lemurs while also improving the quality of people's lives? To answer these questions and so much more, today we're chatting with two inspirational Malagasy lemur experts, Anja Raza Finkrazim, PhD, and Ver Nohindra Hamanazad. Both wonderful ladies grew up in Antananarive, Madagascar, and found their passion for lemurs while exploring the forest of Ranamafana National Park on a trip for their school's environmental club. They met researchers from all over their globe, and their future path was set in motion. Now, Anja is Veru's mentor and a professor at University of California, Berkeley, and Veru very recently moved to the U.S. to begin her Ph.D. under Anja's guidance. Get ready to learn a ton about lemurs' ecological role and what's actually occurring in conservation on the island. If you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to never miss a future episode. Also, follow Rewildology on Instagram and all of the socials to stay up to date on the latest shenanigans happening with the show. All right, friends, here is my conversation with Anja and Veru. Hi, Anja and Veru. Thank you both so much for coming on Rewildology today and talking about a whole different part of the world that I have not had a chance to explore yet. So very excited to talk about this with you too. But before we do, you're both Malagasy, but you're not coming to me from Madagascar. You're in California, which is so cool. So how in the world did you two get to California? So if Anja, you want to start and then Veru, if you want to go after her, but all of us would love to hear how you two got to California from Madagascar. I put. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Paddled the whole way. <laughs> oh, where do we even start? I think I'm going back to high school because that's where I started being, like enjoying nature and like enjoying uh, really wanting to protect the biodiversity of Madagascar and things like that. So in high school, um, well, I grew up in Madagascar. And so I went to this high school in the capital city of Antananarive. And I was part of a group of young environmental students and we were like really into protecting the nature. And so to help us with that every year, uh, we usually go visit a national park in Madagascar so we could learn more about the biodiversity in Madagascar is known for. Um, growing up in the city, we didn't really have access to like going to the forest every day or like enjoying the outdoors every single day, just like being a city kid. <laughs> but that opportunity led me and other students like go explore the forest. And I think it was in junior high, we were able to go to Ranmafana National Park, which is in the southeastern part of Madagascar. And we were like watching lemurs and uh, birds and many of the wildlife that Madagascar has. And then we met a group of scientists 
for like from the US and also from Madagascar um, being research in the rainforest and some of them are biologists so when we went back to Antananarive that's when I enrolled at the University of Antananarive in natural science and fast forward from that from being that kid to more learning about natural science more le learning more about biodiversity and when I was doing my master thesis I was paired with an American student from the U.S. doing research in Madagascar. So we have this great program in Madagascar where any foreigners doing research in Madagascar has to hire at least one Malagasy student and train them to increase the local capacities of the scientists in Madagascar. So cool. And so this Barbara Martinez, that was the PhD, she was a PhD student at that time, I was prepared to work with her, and she was doing research in the northeast of Madagascar on the red raft lemur, the orthopedic lemur, <laughs> um, the red raft lemur. And so I went, and I was just like so amazed in a different side of Madagascar, in a very different part of the country. It was not an easy field war where we flew in one uh, city first and then took a boat and then hiked for a whole day uh, before getting to our site. <laughs> like it was, and then, yeah, but I really enjoyed every part of it, following lemurs every day and um, camping. And I also started learning more about how these lemurs are very important for the forest because they are helping in the regeneration of the forest. So we, work, we worked at this site that had some degraded forest. And so we were trying to understand if the lemurs are able to help with the restoration of those forests because they are eating fruits and then dispersing seeds in those areas. And so I learned more about that and I got excited and I want to learn more about lemurs. And so I did my, also my master's thesis on lemur and how they disperse seeds in the forest. And talking to the PhD student at that time, she was also like introducing me about like how the PhD studies uh, in the U.S. And I got excited about the idea that like, oh, I want to go to the U.S. <laughs> I just, something that I've never thought I would be able to do. I, like growing up as from like one of the poorest countries in the world, you may already know that, but also like in a poor neighborhood growing up as a poor kid and things like that, you don't really like imagine yourself of like even leaving the country or like yes. going, I don't know, like even going to the beach was already a big thing for us because we... The beach is really far Sorry. from the city. And so like even going to the beach is already like a dream. And so going to the US is just like, I'm out of my mind. <laughs> but I'm like, I want to do this. I, so I started like asking her a bunch of questions, what I need to do, how I should do it. So she really helped me like navigate through the, all the different process to apply for a grad program in the US. And then I got accepted to do a PhD at Rice University in Houston, Texas. So after my PhD, moving around a couple of times for um, postdoc, and that's how I ended up at UC Berkeley now. So yeah, trying to make it short, but it's a, it was a very long journey from that, like yeah. the high school kid from the University of Antananarive <laughs> to being a professor at UC Berkeley. It was a very long, amazing journey. And yeah, I just, like, every time I think about it, sometimes it, like, makes me very emotional thinking about, like, oh, hold on, what happened exactly? But yeah. Like, how did I get here? I think the same exactly. thing all the time. Because yeah. I came from... I, I definitely relate when you say just just even going to the beach was, like, such a big thing. Because I come, I come from a very blue-collar more royal part of the United States. And when I was a kid, I think the furthest, because you've now been all over the United States, the furthest I had ever been, so I grew up in Southern Ohio, the furthest I'd ever been was okay. Tennessee, ever. Oh. Until I started my master's program, and that was the first time I actually left the United States, and that was in 2015. So 
I completely get that feeling. You're like, is this real? Like, I'm going to Costa Rica in a couple weeks. I'm like, is this my life? Like, still to this day? Uh, Yeah. I'm pretty sure that you've even... That you've even seen more of the United States than me, right? Because you've been to like <laughs> South Carolina and what was it? Oh yeah, Minnesota or Montana? Which one of them? Uh, we lived in South Dakota. Oh, South Dakota, that's right. <laughs> Close to Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> and then all over Texas. Like, I'm pretty sure you've seen yeah. more than me. And I've lived here all of my <laughs> life. I have no excuse. <laughs> But like, sometimes people don't realize, like, because people think that you just can walk from the center of Madagascar to the beach in five minutes because people don't realize how big that you island don't. is. And I'm like, no, the closest beach I can go is like four hours drive. And that's not even the nicest one. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. just like, that's the closest I can go to. It's like four hours drive. <laughs> yeah, it is not a small island at all. Like when you look no. at a map, it is a very large chunk of land beside yeah. the massive Africa. Like this is not yeah. a small place. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great point. So, oh my gosh, Anja, thanks for sharing. I totally relate to that. But Veru, let's get to you because you're like the next generation of this. So what's <laughs> your story? How in the world did you get to California? She dragged me here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Like, so I've been through pretty much of all of what she has been telling, like the high school program, the same university, the same program of working with uh, foreign researchers. But my foreign researcher was her. That was, was <laughs> Convenient. Yeah. I oh, became yes. a foreign researcher after a while. <laughs> yeah. So that's hilarious. <laughs> it is. And so when I was a child, like my parents could not afford like summer vacation when we were kids. So just like okay, when I grew up, I just need a job that make me travel. If it's just all over Madagascar or all over the world, I don't care. I just need a job that makes me travel. <laughs> I had no idea what it was or where I'm going, how I'm going to do it or where I'm going to do it. No idea. I just grew up like this. I need to travel. And then at the high school, I participated in this environmental club. We went on a field trip at the same park, Ranmafan. <laughs> And I met a lot, like a lot of researchers at that day. Like very explaining as we go into the forest, we stay months. And what struck me most was like, they come from all over the world, Australia, Russia, USA, Europe, Africa, just like all over. It was just like, okay, that's the job. I and found it. it seems to be, yeah, it, that's the job. Like, nothing would stop me from doing this. I have no idea how hard it could be. Or just like, but yeah, let's be a researcher. That's great. And in the meantime, we can protect the environment. Madagascar is special. So it's like, something to do. Great. Got to the university. And at the end of my undergrad program, we went on a field trip in another park on the western so Troy forest and they capture mouse lemurs to study their parasites, their ecology, something like that. And then they had me measured the mouse lemurs, like the mouse lemur is the smallest primate and it can held in your hand, like just like this. And you have to be two people to hold this small, an- this small animal because it's so hyperactive and it's nocturnal and you measure them at dawn. So they become like very active and nervous. So you have to be two people to hold it still <laughs> for you take measurements. So <laughs> it's like, okay, this is great. It's just like, I can relate to this tiny animal because I was like one of the smallest in my cohort and also mo- the most hyperactive. Like <laughs> I talked a lot, I move a lot, like just like... Okay, I can relate to this because that's just that you You're my spirit animal. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> and then um, in 2017, Unzaka uh, came to Madagascar. She already had a student appointed to her project. 
but the latest minute she just uh, left the project. So I was assigned to assist her for a project. And I was told that I'm going to follow her three days before we left. Yes, I didn't have time like to prepare things normally. Just like, <laughs> okay, get your personal stuff. You're coming with us on Monday. That was the instruction. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's the best part of this. So just like, okay, I didn't know what project I'm going to work on. No idea of like how to expect from her or what she expects from her. Just like, you come with us on Monday. Just like, okay. <laughs> I'll be there. And I went. <laughs> yeah. But it turns actually that it was where I really started to think about what I can do and like to be an actual researcher. And we went there, we began field work, we did many uh, field activities. And after a week, she left. <laughs> uh, she left me with a student and a bunch of people in the forest. And we had to coordinate all of the field activities, collect data. And it was at that time, since she studied in seed dispersal, we were just like, and I love Muslimers. We're just like, okay, let's do seed dispersal by Muslimers. And I developed my master's thesis on them. And this project brought me to the USA because since that master's thesis, I, I was just like, okay, maybe a PhD would be a great thing for me to acquire more capacities or more skills and also exchange and also travel, of course. <laughs> So, yeah, and then I applied for a couple of universities and I end up at the University of Berkeley, uh, California, Berkeley. So this is how I get to the USA. Yeah, and you came really not... recent, right? Yeah, I just arrived in August. <laughs> That's wonderful. And we're recording this beginning of November, so... You're fresh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I have to ask both of you, what is the biggest culture shock? What surprised you the most? Mine is the grocery store. The grocery store? <laughs> really? <laughs> it's just like so many things. So, so, so many choices of Yes. buying stuff I remember the first time I went to like a grocery store and buying bread and I had no idea what kind of bread I'm supposed to oh. buy um, so many like you have like the, fre the the bakery with the fresh baked bread and then you have those things in plastics everywhere and like some in the frozen section and it has like whole wheat whole grains all these different things I don't know what bread I'm supposed to buy like <laughs> What do I, like, which one? What if I'm buying the wrong one? Like, what do I need to eat? And apparently, like, you eat, like, pink, different bread for breakfast, different bread to make sandwiches, different bread. I was like, just so many choices. And it was just so yeah. hard for me. Every, like, going to the grocery store at the beginning. Um, yes. Like, in Madagascar, we don't have that many choices. Yeah. And then if I'm using bread as an example, you just, like, have one type of bread. If you want fancy canned type of bread, you may, like, go to one bakery store and that's it. <laughs> and it's just, yeah. like, they may have two or three, but not 50, 40 different <laughs> brands yeah. and types. So, yeah, that was, I think that was, like, my culture shock. Also, like, shopping at farmer's market versus grocery store. So like where we grew up in Madagascar, we go to the farmer's market to buy cheap produce. Yes. Because they are straight from the farmers and it's very cheap. We only go to, go to this supermarket when you have the money and want to buy something fancy. But here, like, we go to the grocery store to buy everything. And when you go to the farmer's market, it's a little bit more expensive than at the grocery store. And it, it took me a while to really, hey, you need to go to the grocery store because that's a little bit cheaper. Or like, it's just not ticking into my head, like, why? It's just hard for me to comprehend that it's not the same as in Madagascar, where we just get fresh produce and cheaper price at the farmer's market. So yeah, it's just completely backwards <laughs> from your childhood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> what about you, Veru? What, what's been, I know you haven't so, been here that I, long, but what do you think has been your biggest culture shock? When I was about to leave Madagascar, many of my friends that live abroad or my family told me everything is big in America. Oh. <laughs> Everyone told me that. It was like, makes sense. It's a continent. Like, we live in the highland. It makes sense. But the first day I arrived, they took me to a burger restaurant. It was huge i couldn't <laughs> finish so it it's like no the fries are huge the well, shakes so. big <laughs> yeah just everything is just big like the format of yogurt you have this pint of yogurt here <laughs> like you just have like a small pot in madagascar everything is just big the cars the house oh. the everything yeah i just like okay this is really big, and I did not expect it. Like, yeah, this is big. Lived up to the stereotype. Of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes I forgot. Like, I, I think because I've lived here for so long, I feel like everything is just normal now. And when Vero came in August and asking me question, and I'm like. Hold on, is not is isn't that what it's supposed to be? It's like <laughs> things that I didn't realize until like she came and then I was like, oh yeah, it's different. It's different. I mean, <laughs> you get used to it after a while. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, and sure, yeah, you acclimate. Like this is your home now, and so you're like, this yeah. is just the way it is. <laughs> and, and then Veru yeah. comes, it's like, no, this isn't the way it is. <laughs> so fresh <laughs> yeah. but oh. she's quick at learning the like at acclimating and learning the new things so she's good at that yeah and you ended up in california <laughs> okay like of all places in the united states <laughs> so it'll end up you ended up in one of the be most beautiful places with so many things so yes. yeah good on you <laughs> great job <laughs> thank you <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> oh well thank you both so much for diving in on that stuff with me so let's shift to what you're both so passionate about here and i i really want to start big picture because i think that most of us in the world that haven't spent much time in madagascar or are from there we might not have an accurate view of what's actually going on from a conservation standpoint, from like an uh, you know environmental issue standpoint. So I would love if you two or one of you or what is actually going on in Madagascar? What are the conservation issues? What are the biggest ones that you're seeing? Good question. Yeah. So if you look at conservation in Madagascar right now, we're going to see fires hunting but mostly fires for now and um it goes all over the island from north to south west west rainforest dry forest spiny forest everything just got burned and this is i think one of the most like the hardest challenge in madagascar and as you know it's one of the poorest country in the world we look happy and we are happy there, but like, it's just hard. And we for this year and last year was the first time we had a food shortage because of climate change. And we try to reverse all of this with reforestation, sensitization, outreach programs, everything by just like, when you still don't have enough food on your plates, you're always looking for the shortest solution to live day by day. So I think that's the, the main conservation issue in Madagascar. So I think if the people are fed normally, have like enough food, enough to save for the year or for just a little bit longer than just day or weeks, it could be better and the pressure on the environment to just start decrease. Yeah. 
So we have this like habitat loss as already like a big problem for the biodiversity, but like on the other hand, we have these very poor people that are like relying also on the natural resources for their lives. And so it's how to say this, like there is a I wanna say challenge, but maybe not challenge is the word. Like there is this interface between like how do you protect the biodiversity but also like ensure the well being of the humans that are like relying on this. And I think that's the main problem that we're having right now in Madagascar. It's just like trying that balance of like benefiting both the biodiversity and the human well being. And and what do you think is driving that? Is it a growing population or what what are the forms of climate change that you're seeing and experiencing? Because I know that these aren't mutually exclusive. All of this is happening at the same time. Since you've experienced this for so long and have been studying it, what is the main driver here? Like all mixed in some ways. Again, as you said, not mutually exclusive. It's also specific to some region. Like in the south, it's very dry, so mostly yeah. climate change. And in the cities, it's because there are too many people. And I think it's just changed from one region to another. And we have their own lot of biodiversity issues, I guess. So like in some part of the country, we've seen like habitat loss because people are like expanding on the uh, agricultural field to sustain mm-hmm. their lives. And so you mean like they have to cut some part of the forest so they can like grow more rice or grow some crops that they need for their everyday mm-hmm. life. And we're not even talking about like clearing a whole rainforest for palm oil or, you know, like for food industry or anything like that. We're just talking about like people trying to survive in this already hard life and so like someone just like clearing a patch of forest so they are able to grow some crops that they need every day to eat or maybe to sell at the market so they can get a little bit of money. In other parts of Madagascar, because they are already like having issues with um, not having enough on their plates, they may agree to participate in uh, like the large food industry trying to plant more peanuts, as an example. I think peanuts was one of the things going on. But like agriculture, like more intensive agriculture. And so there are some, like as Ferro said, it really depends from region to region and like specific to what's going on in that region. What's, what's happening for like each group of people has their own issues. It's really hard. Every time I talk about the conservation in Madagascar, it's just like, I, I don't know. I don't have a solution. Like, I don't know what to do because you care. Like, I do care about the biodiversity. I do care about the wildlife. But I also care about the, my Malagasy fellow. And I was just like, it's just so, it's a very sensitive topic in one sense. Because it's just like, I, I want to talk about the wildlife all the time. But I also care about the the well-being of the people. So I think my point is that we cannot just like, Think about one way, but not the other. But it has to go like hand in hand. I know that makes sense. Oh, one hundred percent, it does. It does. <laughs> and I, I love that you you bring that up because I think there is now more of a movement. And I just recently released an episode on like nature based solutions. And one of the whole pillars of nature based solutions is it has to provide some sustainable livelihood for the communities that are involved there. So it's two different things. So it's like solving some sort of issue with working with nature to solve whatever issue it is that needs to be solved. And at the same time, helping local people. And that, that last part was almost always left out of the conservation conversation before. And we're starting to see, well, not, we're not starting. We see the impact of that. And yeah. I think like, you know, with all like our generation and obviously us three are in that generation, I feel like we're starting to see and acknowledge that and be like, you can't leave people out of the conversation because if exactly. people are hungry, why in the heck would they care about a lemur or a baobab exactly. tree 
Like if you can't feed your family, I mean, I'm a very family oriented person. I'm sure both of you are as well. If I can't feed my family, am I going to care what some conservationist says when they come in yeah. to my village? <laughs> Get out of here. Exactly. I don't care. So yeah, that part of the conversation, I, I love to keep bringing up because it is, it's really humanitarian yeah. thing just as much as it is like a conservation thing. And you two see it firsthand, it sounds like. And it's, it's even like hard because like, these are like your family, Malagasy. Like we have this strong bond of like knowing that if you're the Malagasy, you're my family in that sense. So it's really like, it hits you hard thinking about like, oh, I do care about the biodiversity conservation, but then I have my family there too that I need to think about as well. So just hard sometimes. Exactly. And Veru, did you see very similar things? I know because you just left. What, from your experiences, have you seen anything different or has it gotten worse or any firsthand experiences of these kind of issues? Um, in the site I was working, so before I left, I was on field work with the pandemic, with all of the post-pandemic consequences at social and economic level. It was just hard. Like you came into the village, you want to hire people to work with you. You're just like, I don't even have rice to eat tonight to feed my family. Why would I care following you in the forest? Like working with you for 10 days or something like that. Just like in some parts, it gets hard, harder than it was before. In some parts, people are uh, starting being more aware of like, if I burn this forest patch, I would not have water to for my crop or for my rice field, something like that. So one of the things we do when we get there, just try to explain that, not to force them, but just make them understand like, if you do this, this will be the consequences. And I'm sure you've already seen it, but you didn't make the link, something like that. And so when they understand, they are more aware of like, okay, I need to change this part of my life. But it's not easy, especially when they do not access to like tools or opportunity to grow what they want to do, but just like do what they have at the moment. It's... I don't know, it's just complicated, feasible, but needs lots of will to do things and also lots of patience because you can't change things from today to tomorrow and just like telling this and expect this result. And even though like they, they understand it, if they can't do it, they wouldn't just, yeah, it's... It just makes sense that they don't want to do it because they can't or they don't have the opportunity to do it. Mm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that was that was so okay. good. Yeah, thank both of you for, for really going into that with me. And the reason why I wanted to start there is because what the greater community is experiencing obviously directly affects lemurs which are your, both of your passions. And so if we understand what's happening on the bigger picture with what these communities are going through, which then the lemurs are suffering from as well, then as we start to transition into that, all of the rest of this is gonna make more sense. So let's go back to that. And then we're gonna come back to all of this full picture too. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna circle back okay. around. Yeah. <laughs> so so yes, thanks, thanks for diving into that with me. But now, now let's transition to lemurs. So. First, let's talk about the super fun stuff about lemurs. Why are they so different than other primates? And like, so let's just go, let's start diving into their natural history. Why are lemurs so different than, you know, other primate species, you know, especially the apes, we all know how different they are from that. But yeah, so start giving us some like fun facts, some natural history of, of lemurs. And we're going to go from there. Okay, I can dive in. So, you know, Madagascar split from the mainland Africa and from India um, 80 million years ago, if I'm, if I'm correct. And so 
a lot of the species that that are on Madagascar are not similar to any of these um, two parts. But what's unique about uh, lemurs is that the ancestor of lemurs that came to Madagascar diversified on the island of Madagascar, within different niches, different places on the island. So that's why they are very different, because they diversified on the island of Madagascar. And that's why they have different features. That's why they are only found on the island of Madagascar. Because of that, sorry, I'm sidetracked right now. Like, <laughs> Go ahead. I gave a talk last week, and I was talking about the lemur. Like it was in Zoom, so I have no idea who the people behind the screens are. <laughs> but I gave a talk talking about lemurs and plants and how they disperse it. And then when it comes to the question and answer, this person was like, "You should study the monkeys of Madagascar." <laughs> and my head was like went full blown like this. Is like. We don't have monkeys. <laughs> and didn't you just hear we talk about the lemurs and how like they're <laughs> unique in Madagascar and so on? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Don't those moments where you just have to like, I'm a professional. I just need to like. So it's just like, <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I also, how am I supposed to answer that? Yeah. Like, I'm just like, it's like, okay, did you just yeah, listen to me speak for an hour? There's no monkeys here. <laughs> I, check, I, I, I don't get it. Maybe we do, but I'm not aware of. I know. <laughs> There's no monkeys there. Oh my gosh, that is hilarious. That is so funny. But yeah, one of those moments where you're like, how do I not be an asshole right now? He's <laughs> like, I'm studying the lemurs here. But okay, 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 awesome. So so let's get into your work then, like, and what you've studied over the years and what you have found. So Anja, I would love to start with you. Let's start to go into that. What are the, some of the things that you've discovered in, in your work? Because you, you were mostly working on seed dispersal, right? And lemurs role yeah. in forest regeneration. So that is so exciting. So let's go into that. What species did you work on? What did you find? Everything. I want to hear everything. Okay, so I spent... Most of my time on three large lemurs in rainforest uh, of Ranumafana National Park in the southeastern, the one I was telling about earlier, where I first had my haha moment. But I've been studying the red-bellied lemur and the black and white raft lemur. And I wish I had pictures of them to show you, but they are the largest frugivores. Like in Ranmafana, but also the, the general, the largest frugivores in Madagascar. And so they're eating seeds and dispersing them, like they eating the fruits and then swallowing the, the seed intact. And then they're dispersing the seeds when they're moving around. Uh, they're able to disperse seeds that are like small size, like very small and large ones, like maybe this big. And by passing through their gut, the seeds are, like, have greater chance of sprouting, of germinating, and becoming seedlings. But what's even cooler is that this... Cooler is that in the world? Oh, yeah. Um, so, it also. <laughs> maybe not in this sense, but what's even awesome, <laughs> let's use that, is that, like, they don't really, like, choose where to to bring the seeds because they move around and they defecate everywhere. But like, what's really interesting is that they are taking the seeds in micro habitat that are very suitable for the germination of these seeds. So it's not that they are passing the seed intact, but also they are taking the seeds where they need to be to be able to germinate and be able to sprout and become a seedling and eventually an adult tree. And, and also, because they are doing that, they are structuring the forest in some sense, helping diversify the, the rainforest. Because if like, they are taking a seed of one species from here, taking that somewhere else where it's not um, usually found, they are helping structure where you would find those different trees within the forest. And so that's... Really cool. And also because, because of that, like, very important role on, like, in helping if the demography of the plants and structure in the rainforest, if we're losing them, that may have some impact on the forest as a whole, on the health of the ecosystem as a whole. So one of the things I was looking at 
was what will happen um, to the population of the tree, or well, like one specific tree species, if we're losing this lemur frugivore that are dispersing them. So we did some uh, simulation models using data from like observing them and doing some experiments, and then we found that if we lose them, so they are not dispersing the seeds, but the seeds will just like fall under the parent tree because nothing is moving them around. We found that the probabilities of these seeds to become seedling is very slim compared to if, if the lemurs would be able to take them in different microhabitat and farm them away. And also it's like, okay, so that happens to the population. What happens to humans if they going really like taking the links of from the lemurs to humans, what will happen? But again, there is no like direct link from a lemur to human to look at like what will happen. Um, I was looking at how um, the loss of these lemurs would affect the capacity of the forest to store carbon, which is very important for humans, as you may already know. And so I did uh, some simulation where we would lose some of the plants that these lemurs are able to disperse, so specifically the trees with very large trunk that are able to store carbon more than the small trunk uh, trees. And so we did some simulation and we found that there is a steep decline in the ability of the forest to store at least above ground carbon if you lose this lemur, this different lemur species. Wow, so they're really so important keys though. I can go on and talk yeah. about the lemurs and seed dispersal, <laughs> but I think those are like a few of the main finding and exciting things about my research that I really like so far. And I'm still wow. diving into more looking at that. Yeah. So they're like a true keystone species for the island then? They are keystone species. Yeah. Um, wow. It's, and do they have the same role or importance for all of all might be a uh, way too much of a general term, but at least the vast majority of the ecosystems that they're found in across the island, are they like a keystone for pretty much all of them or just these they're, important species? They are keystone for pretty much all the different ecosystems where they, found, they are mm-hmm. found. So they are found in several places across Madagascar. And so, yeah. Also, because like Madagascar doesn't have these very large birds that in like in other systems, the trees with very large seeds only dispersed by the lemur species. But those big, large lemur species are the only one who are able to disperse the seeds of those. So the large seeded plants really rely on them to be able to move around and reach new habitat. So wow. right now we're looking like we're doing this project of like looking at what will happen to the very the ones with the very large seeds if they don't have their dispersers. That is so fascinating. I didn't I didn't even think about that. About large bird species, like you know, the hornbills and stuff, the greater hornbills and stuff like in India. So there there isn't like a similar bird on Madagascar to fill that niche. We don't have the horn bill. Oh. No. Yeah. Wow. Only the raptors yeah. are that big in Madagascar. If you but talk not about the frigivores. But not the frigivores ones. Wow. Yeah. Madagascar is so cool. Like, yeah. <laughs> so we we even have some plants. Do you know like the baobab trees? So like we have some plants like the baobabs that don't have their dispersers. We, we used to have very large lemurs. I think I forgot yeah. to talk about that before. We had very large lemurs that are like... How big gorilla-like. were they? Like, like a bigger than a human. Well, at least bigger than me. Wow! <laughs> <Quite> small. <laughs> yeah, we used to have very big lemurs, but they went extinct. So those lemurs may have been responsible for the dispersal of the large seeded tree species in Madagascar. Uh, but now they are gone, and so we don't know what's happening to the those see, like those plants that don't have their dispersers anymore. So we're trying to test some hypotheses of like looking at different dispersal mechanism as well. When did those lemurs go extinct? Uh, like in the 
15 on grid years ago, I believe, or somewhere around that line. Was it human? Like ancient ancestor humans that wiped them out, you think? Or is that when humans had landed on the island? Or what do you think it was that took yeah, them I out? think it, it's when humans Mixed started up. like colonizing the island. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure exactly yet on how, <laughs> because there have been a lot of discussion about that. But yeah, yeah, we're really so good had, at killing things. We, we <laughs> lost, I think, seventeen <laughs> different species of lemurs already extinct. Wow! Like from from then till now. Uh, then seventeen wow. already extinct. Um, now ninety about like ninety six percent of currently highly endangered. Endangered. Oh, that has to make you sick and to so, your stomach. So that's why I'm like, that's why I'm interested in like looking at the role and how, like what happens to the forest when you're losing this very important uh, species that play this very important role. Mm. Yes, mm. absolutely. And also, like, so to add on that, there is also like a thing we have observed in the field, like when you explain the roles of animals in the forest people understand how important they are and act on protecting them than just saying this species are the flagship for Madagascar or this species really unique to Madagascar. That doesn't work. Yeah. So when, yeah, when we explain them, you know even the, the smallest lemur, if they eat the seeds of this plant, they would regenerate it. In this part of the forest, they would just like understand how unique their role are, why they need to persist in this forest, and how they could benefit from the survival of the the lemurs in this particular forest. And it's just like, even if you say like, they are endangered and it's because of us and we're killing them by doing this and by doing that, but when they don't understand the consequences of killing this animal in this ecosystem, they just don't care. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. That's just like, I don't, why does, why does it affect me at all? If that species is taken out, like, okay, cool. Thanks for the fact, you know? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because it ends up being like, oh, so you think the animal is more important than me Mm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's like hard to argue on that um, sense. But like if you show them the important role and how that would affect us in some ways, that's more like there is something there. Yeah. Yeah. Your relatability is huge. It's like, how does this actually yeah. benefit you? Yeah, exactly. And then you, Veru, what, what about you? What are you studying? What have you learned with your particular species? So as a lemur, they have pretty much the same role as the large bodied lemurs. But what really surprised me with the mouse lemurs when I studied the cities person is that they are more, eat more native plant species than the introduced or the invasive species in the forest. And I think that's cool because they can regenerate more native plant species. Another thing we found was that they they can live in the edge of the forest or even in the degraded uh, forest. And they can continue to provide seed dispersal services in those areas. And in one of the sites I was working, it was a very fragmented forest. They can even go out of the forest and eat on the shrub that is in the open land. And they can defecate there and deposit seeds. And I think that's really cool that this tiny thing can do this much. And there is, there is even a study that they have done that they contribute to the restoration. Like when they do reforestation project, the the mouse lemurs contribute to disperse seeds in those reforested areas and increase the diversity of the the forest. And that is just so cool that we don't expect this animal to eat that much fruit 
and to do some of this cool stuff. It's really interesting. And for now, I'm trying to look at if there is a difference between males and females because males are more solitary and females live in group at least during just a couple of months after they give birth. And it may change the way they disperse it throughout the forest. And also the difference if they are more active on the forest edges or inside, like in the uh, interior of the forest. And also, like, I'm really interested in, like, um, look at their effectiveness across fragmented landscapes and what they could bring to reverse or at least begin, initiate the, the regeneration of the forest. Wow. That is amazing. For like an animal, let's say, <laughs> how much do they weigh? How many grams? 60 grams. Yeah. You can say on grams. average. Yeah. 60 grams. 60. 60 grams? 60. Yeah, that is on so average. small. <laughs> I know. That's so that cute. That's just adorable. Oh my God. You all, <laughs> both of you will definitely need to send me some photos of like, you yeah. working and so that we can have sure. visuals <laughs> of these lemurs oh my so god she studies the small one and i study the big one <laughs> you balance each other out you're like i get the big you get yeah. the little we meet in the middle yeah. <laughs> so since you both know your species so well and and taking this to the lemur side what have you seen as the biggest threats that they're currently up against i think habitat loss Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is the main threat. Oh, I think I, I don't know if they will say this. One another thing like Peggy and Christine think that the Muslim like why the Muslim really matter too is that the large lemur, at least the one I study, are very sensitive to the habitat loss and like the degradation of the forest. But these Muslim, they can persist in degraded habitat, in like very disturbed habitat. They can live pretty much anywhere. So in places yeah. where we don't see the large lemur, you might see the tiny moss lemur. And so they might be able to disperse the seeds of the plant species. Well, they will not be able to disperse the large ones, but at but least they least, are very yeah. important for the plant species with the large seeds in those degraded habitat where the large lemurs are absent because they can't survive in those places. So yeah. that's pretty cool. That's it's super those, cool. The, again, the tiny ones, um, <laughs> the tiny ones coming to the rescue. You should actually like have like a cape, like make a logo of a mass lemur with a cape. Mass lemur to the rescue. That's adorable. Please make these, Anja. Please and send me a photo. I will even wear one if you I, make one of I, these. We actually, we actually already have some picture resemblance to that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you the really? one we did for... Um, okay, we we'll send you a, like, okay, the, again, one of please. our um, yeah. friends made a true... Uh, we had this lemur drawing contest last week and he drew a mass lemur with a spare or something. It's so cute. We send it out. Oh my God, please send me that. Oh my God. This sounds incredible. We'll have to share it for sure because I'm sure everyone's going to be like, I want to see oh this. My goodness. So please, please definitely send that on. Please send that on. Yeah. So, okay. So yeah. you see habitat loss is, you would say is probably their number one thing that they're experiencing. How much habitat loss has happened on Madagascar? Wow. At least a, a ballpark. Um, like we lost more than the half. Yeah, more than half of the More than the half of the forest areas in 50 years. Mm. And was the whole island it's forested? It's insane. Was the, or the majority of the island forested or? The whole island. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Maybe the majority of the island was forested mm. before, but it also had some grasslands uh, in Madagascar that didn't make places with no forest before. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And, and here's where I wanted to tie it back to the people side. So clearly we want everybody, we want our fellow people to thrive, and we also want our biodiversity to thrive. And sometimes that's in conflict with each other, and sometimes that's not. 
what do you two think is a possible viable solution to help both if you think there might be one? I'm sure there is. What is it? There's a way. <laughs> I'm just like, to tell do me. That. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I kind of want to say, like, take care of the humans first. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, it's hard to convince people on that that like we, maybe you need to talk about the people first before yeah I looking agree. at the biodiversity maybe that's what we need to do is mm-hmm. let's take care of the humans first and then maybe the rest will follow yeah i haven't done that in that sense but i mean that makes sense you know the hierarchy of needs if you're not even fulfilling the basic need of food security then how can you think of lemur conservation, you know? Yeah. But that, that's a really mm-hmm. good point, yeah. Maybe if we solve yeah. those issues first, and obviously I, I don't know what any of those are. I mean, well, you've done a very great job of explaining the issues about how to solve them. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Do, does someone else step in? I mean, it's always so iffy when other countries step into other countries' business and... That's always an issue, but at the same time, it's like, is that a good solution? I mean, I don't, I don't know. But if the population yeah. of Madagascar isn't getting enough food, like, that's terrible. Well, I, I think Vera and I have been very, like, sounding very hopeless <laughs> in the fact that they were Like, it's so sad what's happening in Madagascar, but there are also, like, some good things happening of, like, a lot of organization, like, local organization and international organization that are already doing things like that like trying to balance the human needs with biodiversity conservation so it's not like Madagascar is doomed and we don't have any solution it's not like that there is do have hopes that we're gonna see the light at the end of the tunnel like there is a way to get out of it and like help both the humans and the wildlife but we really need to like look at both and not just like focus on Both one side. or the other. Um, they really need to go hand in hand. And there are a lot of organizations in Madagascar that are already working on that. And that's really great. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. what we need. And even though it works at a like, very specific place, it gives the example. So I think yeah. that is something we... We Malagasy need, like, we need to see things work and then doing it after. So yeah. I think this, even if it is like pilot project or just like a very temporary project, we, they give the example and they show everyone at any level that it is doable. We can do it. We just need some will to really do it and a little bit of opportunity to make it happen. And I have to ask, is this part of the inspiration of the organization that you two founded? Because I really wanted to take a time to talk about this. So, so tell me about this organization, you know, what's it called and what's your greater mission that you two are hoping to accomplish? Go first. (laughs) (laughs) Either of you. You can go ahead. (laughs) Yeah, so this is one of our long-term goal, like to be able to do that, like conservation along with empowerment of local communities. But uh, the organization, so let me start at the beginning. It is called (laughs) ARSIGN, and it's an association of conservation biologists. And we are on Malagasy in the, in the association, students, professors, and we have really different background. Like the both of us to see this person, they are botanists, they are entomologists, many different backgrounds. Our first mission is to use scientific knowledge to inform the general public about the biodiversity what we can do at our level, and also to facilitate research 
Madagascar because it's not really easy. We don't have fund, a national fund for research. And even if we have, it's really small. So we still rely on international funds for research and for conservation projects. So what we really want to do is to kind of link the international with the local capacities that what we can do locally, we can do it from what we have and what the international scientific community could uh, provide us, something like that. That's incredible. Did I miss something? <laughs> no, no, you didn't miss anything. I was trying to like translate our sign in English. It's like we had a meaning why we chose that name, but I'm, I'm like having a hard time explaining it in English, the name. Yeah. I was thinking about conscious, aware, but oh, yeah. it's not really that. Yeah, but yeah, so, it means that, like, aware, conscious. So, so, like Sina, so the name is Ari Saina, A-R-Y, um, S-A-I-N-A. So Saina in, like, mean, like, mind, because around that, and, like, Ari Saina is, like, you becoming more aware and yeah. more conscious. I think that's yeah. I think that's the best way to describe what it means. So we chose the name because like we're aware of what's going on and we're conscious of what's going on in Madagascar and we want to make other people to be aware and conscious and like work with us to yeah. like to participate in the conservation of the biodiversity in Madagascar. And so as Vera already said, it's not just limer conservation, but like looking at the biodiversity as a whole. So we have different, uh, like the members, like different people from different backgrounds working on bats, insects, plants, and like so many different things going on. We even have uh, so, like someone working with the marine biology. And so it's very, we're just interested in the whole biodiversity, the whole country of Madagascar and trying to not only like increase the scientific capacity of the Malagasy people, but also make people more aware of the scientific research and the finding of those science. So we do a lot of like science communication stuff to yes. the public. Most of the time, like you read um, the finding of research in, in scientific publications and mostly in English. And not a lot of Malagasy people speak English. Not even a lot of Malagas speak French, one of the languages spoken on the country. But we're trying to reach broad audience in Madagascar, so always like translate those scientific findings into Malagasy for the Malagasy people to be aware of like, oh, that's what's going on in our country. That's so they can use the finding to also raise awareness, take actions. Yeah, I just wanted to add that we also want to stand as a model that science is something fun and uh, yeah. that you, you can live from it. Like you can be a researcher and live a life of a researcher and also have like a life, but not just <laughs> focused on what you're doing in the forest, something like that. And that it matters. I wouldn't say it like... It's not just a job, but it's also a motivation. Yeah. Sounds like it's your why. This is what I'm here oh, to yeah. do. Like this is yeah. This is my calling. Exactly. You can call it that or whatever yeah. anybody believes yeah. in. But you know, this is this is what I'm Absolutely. here to do. And I get paid to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do never get bored doing science. That's for you true. always find something, yeah. You always find something new, and especially if you work like for us in natural science, you never get bored. <laughs> There's always something new, something cool, something unexpected that blows your mind. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. And so, how can anybody? I always love. I love action. Because we can sit here and talk to her blue in the face and have so much fun and we can drink wine and do all this fun stuff. But if no one knows what to do or how to help, then like, what's the point? 
So how can anybody help your specific organization since we're talking about it? What's the best way for someone to go about that? We do have a website. Um, we can send you the website so you can yes. add into the link. We're also very active on Facebook. Uh, we are not active on Instagram yet, but we've been talking about doing that. We chose Facebook because, again, our audience is Malagasy people in Madagascar. And a lot of Malagasy people use Facebook over any other the social media platforms. And so it's easier for us to reach them if we're on Facebook, because that's where they are. So, but now we've been thinking of like, maybe go to Twitter and add Instagram. But yeah, for now, we just like Facebook and the website. So we can share those to you. And you can also interact directly with the members. Like Unza or me or the other members, just like through email or through our media, our social media. It always Perfect. works. Perfect. Yeah. So that is fantastic. And the next point here. So th there's your organization, which is just great. So it's, it's, it's so fantastic. It is bringing the power of scientific education to the greater public, especially because it is so hard I mean, it's, honestly, it's part of the reason why this podcast exists, because it is so hard to get good scientific knowledge and then also understand it and know the people who are doing the work, a.k.a. both of you, like you two amazing, inspirational women. But if your name is just there on that paper, no one knows. No one knows who you are. And so that's part of like why this exists. So yeah. the exact same thing. So. I completely love what you're doing. I love it so much. So, so let's take it back even bigger picture. So let's say that somebody listening is super inspired and they're like, I want to do whatever I can to help lemurs and to help, you know, Malagasy forests. How can anybody abroad or in Madagascar or wherever they are help with this issue and this species, hmm. these species? That's plural. <laughs> no one, multiple. <laughs> one, I think that just like pops in my head right now is like one thing, like if you can donate, maybe I can say that, right? Oh, of course you can. If you can like if you can donate to organization, you can donate to the local, the organization that does conservation work in Madagascar. And there are many. If you don't know where to start, well, you can start with Arisena. <laughs> Well, yeah. mm -hmm. um, other organization you can look up through the Limer Conservation Network. So there is this group of like Limer Conservation Network, and they have a list of all the organization that does Limer Conservation work in Madagascar. So that's a very good that's a good start to if you wanna find another place. They also like have a list of places where you can volunteer if you're able to do that. Yeah. Or again, you may also volunteer with our group to do field research in Madagascar. Uh, those are things that may be like too out of the way or like because you would need money for all of this, you may. Uh, like one of the things that people can do is like raise awareness. And so raising awareness for what we did earlier this year was like raising awareness to people not to not share pictures on social media, pictures of lemurs or any primate not in their natural environments like as pets like playing with a lemur that looks like having fun on your shoulder or like having fun in your hands but not really uh, because they are not in their natural habitat and so even that little thing of like stopping sharing those pictures or videos of animals in people's home is already a great thing that you can do yeah. because like, by sharing those kind of pictures and videos, you like sending a message that these animals are okay to be domesticated. They are okay to be pets. And so like it minimizes the idea of them being endangered. So if people would think like, oh, they are cute. And so I can like have them as, as pets. I'm going to go to Madagascar and get a lemur as a pet or something like that. So it, like it, changes people's behavior toward them, thinking that it's okay to have them as pets. So even that small act of not sharing a picture that you saw on Instagram is already a big thing. Not sharing that cute video of a lemur in someone's house is already a big thing. Or even speaking up about it 
is talking yeah. to the people not to do this or something like that. I'm not very vocal on social media, so I may not be a good person to give an example <laughs> on that. But that would be just like one example of like people can do. Now. So one thing I would add to all of this things you can do is also support Malagasy students. Oh yeah. Malagasy students are great. They're great. And <laughs> they work hard. They can do like when they know what they have to do, when they are convinced about what they love and what they want, they can do amazing things. So I think that's also something uh, you can help with the protection yeah. of the lemurs, like supporting university students or even not just university, but just like middle school, high school, even primary school about uh, getting more aware about the lemurs or supporting student researcher on the lemurs. There are thousands and thousands of students studying lemurs in Madagascar. And even just like an opportunity of maybe an equip an equipment or supply that would help do something more with yeah. what they already have in Madagascar. Yeah. That is something yeah. that's, that that's changes many things i am one of those students that have benefited something like that so it's like yeah it changes my life my point of view and it pushes me forward like to do something better and better every day hmm. oh that's beautiful that's such a great do example i was like do you want more <laughs> well i i have a question i i and this is tied in and let me know i mean because since you know you both study at rana mafana which is the you know one of the most famous national parks in, in madagascar and i'm a conservation travel specialist like that's what i i know and do and my former company had a really well-known trip that they did to madagascar and do you see tourism like good sustainable tourism as a possible way to help lemurs um do you see any evidence of that or or what do you think in your experience yeah it is i mean i think tourism is one of our source of income in madagascar it's very lucrative i would say yeah it can contribute to project lemurs and in that line there are many organizations governmental non-governmental that works on this like making tourism uh, sustainable for the lemurs and for the livelihood of the local popu uh, populations just like to make it uh, a source of income but also a way to protect the habitats and the lemur population and even though it is at a very small scale it works and it's really i would say viable is that a word yeah <laughs> viable for this population i think it's well, it was a um, issue with the pandemic that it just yeah. cut down everything. But before that, tourism is one of the ways to, to gain money to protect the lemurs. Yeah. Responsible tourism. Yeah. Keyword. Definitely. Yes. <laughs> Responsible. Keyword. Keyword. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, everybody who's been listening to this podcast for a while will know that I'm a really big advocate for responsible, well done travel for that exact reason, because it places a value yeah. dollar on the wildlife and very few other industries do. So that's why I'm such a personal big advocate for it. Of course, it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve everything. It's yeah. not going to feed everybody on Madagascar. Yeah. So it can't be the only solution, but it can be a strong tool in the tool belt to solve things. So yeah. And yeah. next, I would love to ask both of you this since you're both in different parts of your career. You have moved abroad. You have seen so much. You've done so much. If you have one piece of advice for anybody listening here, and it could either be people in the field or people that are just conservation admirers, what would you like to say or a piece of advice that you would like to give to anybody listening? Don't be afraid to dream. That's beautiful. Go go on, expand. Yeah, there's like everything starts with a dream or just like something you want, something that just fuels you every day. So I think if you know what you want, it 
easier for you to do it. And for example, just like traveling, that was my dream. And I do it, I gain money from it. <laughs> I do what I love, I never get bored. It's hard, I agree. But it's just bearable when you when you love what you do. So I think that dreaming is something that you should never put aside. But just keep, and it gives you a goal, a purpose that just to achieve at some point on your of your life. Yeah, oh, so good. I couldn't agree more. Did anything come up to mind, Anja? Science can be fun. Uh, I think that would be my advice. Like, do science. It's fun. It it's for everyone. It's just like science can be fun. And if you really want to do it, it doesn't matter what your gender is. It doesn't matter. Just like do it if you, it, it's fun. It can be fun. Well, it is fun. Not can be, but it is fun. It, it is. I, I really like discovering new things. It excites like my brain. Just Sorry, I'm bubbling. I no, love I it. love it. I love it. And I lo- really love that you brought that up about just we need everybody in science because when we only have one group of people in science or one gender in science or one sex or whatever you want to say, it's easy for it to become naturally biased because we don't know what we don't know. Like, we don't know what it's like to be a man in any of this, just like they can't know what it's like to be a woman. And yeah. so it's so yeah. important to have as many viewpoints from as many people with as many backgrounds in science, because your life experience is different than Veru's, which is different than mine. And we all bring something so special to the table when it comes to science. And yeah. so I might think of a, a way to look at something that's completely different than you. And you're going to think of something completely different than me. And we're all coming to the table together to answer this one question. And the more voices we have at that table, oh, the more likely we're going to solve whatever it is we're trying to solve, which is saving the world. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this has been so much fun. You two are amazing. And I'm sure that there might be somebody listening that wants to reach out and get a hold of you. So what is the best way to get a hold of you two? Um, well, I can be reached by email. Uh, O-N-J-A, my first name, at berkeley.edu. That's my email. But I'm also on Twitter. Um, so I, you can find me on Twitter with Onza Razafi. I can give you the... The, the, the handles. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the better, what's yeah. the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, also on my email. So, Fiona Rinja, my first name, at berkeley.edu. I said it to you. I have also a Twitter handle where you can message me or comment on the things I tweet. And I have a Instagram page where I share landscapes and animals from Madagascar. So you can definitely reach me through that too. Oh, that's so great. Yeah. That's so great. I know. Yeah. You just started following Rewildology today and I'm like, follow back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I should that. do Instagram someday. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like a lot of follow Instagram and I'm like, I don't I'm know what that biased. is. <laughs> I, Instagram is definitely my favorite social platform. So that that's the one that Rewildology is <laughs> Then, subsequently, the most active on because it's my favorite. So, but I'm on all the things. Rewildology (laughs) is on all the things. But yeah, that's the one I'm most active on. So, yeah, but yeah, very followed me earlier. I'm like, ah, follow back. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I'm here like the old lady not knowing how to use Instagram. (laughs) Not at all. I think we all have that platform that we like, you know, like, vibe to yeah. and twitter's so big and like the scientific community and stuff and yeah i'm, I'm behind yeah. there <laughs> yeah i gotta get yeah. on that so <laughs> it is fine <laughs> i hope you get a chance to go to malagascar i want to go so bad yeah. it's not even funny and maybe that's something that we should chat about offline i was gonna say maybe can... you can go with us next year because Boom. we're gonna go next summer 
Done. Let's go. <laughs> you can be our field assistant. Done. Let's go. Us around watching Lima. And... <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you both so much for coming on today. And I cannot wait to tell everybody your story and get everybody involved in Lima conservation. <laughs> Thank you for inviting us and for yeah. telling our story. Thank you. Thank you so much. And especially like for an early career researcher like me, it's very important. Thank you so much. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you both. I can't wait to get this out. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. <laughs>